Hello, Asalaamu Alaikum everybody, hope you're all safe, sound and healthy and I just posted the chat and spit interview that I did like ages ago in the year 2020, in December actually 2020, um, which was against uh, the then upcoming release of my uh, latest fiction novel um, called A Novel. Um, and amazingly, I never posted it on my podcast. I don't know why, because originally, um, I, you know, when I did the interview, originally my plan was that because my interview was basically a podcast, I mean, it was radio. So, you know, um, I was supposed to share it on my podcast, but for some reason, some odd reason, I seem to have had it on, uh, on, uh, in MP4 format and I had posted it on YouTube, obviously, but I mean, as I'm just amazed, I'm still amazed that I <laughs> never posted it here, seriously. In fact, I suddenly started checking. It just somehow crossed my mind, you know, that it should have been in my podcast. I mean, I, I've been looking for it since yesterday, just to make sure, you know, that I don't double post. But yeah, it was nowhere to be found on my podcast. That is so weird. That's my bad, seriously. So I have posted it. I've uploaded it on my podcast. Not that it's going to be of any help, I guess. I mean, but at the same time, it is. Because first of all, it, I talk about my book. Um, and since then, I never actually marketed my book. And so I still get these odd complaints from sudden readers that you know suddenly come across it and they're like okay why haven't we heard of it before so what can I say what can I say I've already talked about that in other podcast episodes as well as to how I cannot avail facilities that Amazon provides to writers in the United States and certain countries most of the other countries like mine we actually do not have those facilities to actually promote our books um, plus, another thing that, you know, um, I talked about how Amazon indeed does shadow ban books, um, as do various uh, book promotion sites that claim to, you know, um, promote your books and all. Um, they tend to shy away from novels and books that have themes and subjects um, that, you know, sort of... Um, challenge the brainwashed views you know of the western world the people of the western world so they challenge the cliche norms they challenge the cliche i views opinions ideas regarding certain cultures countries religions um for example um how finally the people of the west have realized how they've been lied to for almost a century regarding Palestine. Um, and I feel that it's a century too late for them to wake up and realize, given the history of the Western public, uh, you know, regarding their sleep mode, you know, regarding the fact that they are always waking up after the damage is done. Sometimes I wonder if it's deliberate, even in the public's part. Um, they woke up after damage was done to Iraq. They woke up after damage was done to Syria. They woke up after damage was done to Lebanon. In fact, I think they still haven't woken up to Syria and Lebanon properly. Um, you know, and they're waking up to Palestine now. And they almost woke up because of Imran Khan to not uh, actually... Uh, it the, a huge part of of Palestine once again coming on the map, um, on a very serious note was because of, uh, one of uh, Imran Khan was one of the you know people, one of the reasons you can say, he worked really hard on bringing back both Kashmir and Palestine back on the map, you know, um, and drumming it into every single, uh, United Nations meetings, assemblies in the OIC, you know, um, he was working really hard to, you know, uh, bring the OIC back in action, you know, reminding them of what the, the actual purpose of the OIC was when Pakistan founded the OIC and gave the honorary chairperson position to Saudi Arabia, you know. So, um, you know, giving the OIC back its backbone was one of the most important things that Imran Khan did. And again, this is the reason why the U.S. establishment had to get rid of Imran Khan. 
why they had to oust him why he's in jail right now why they're making pakistan a banana republic because pakistan has always been one true threat to israeli occupation uh, of palestine and pakistan has always been again a threat to any further occupation of the already occupied kashmir and that is why you know uh, that is just one of the reasons why pakistan needed to be under control uh, apart from that um, the fact that kashmir right now is going through the exact same thing that uh, that um, palestine is and yet you can see that although finally palace and and both of them have been suffering for the exact amount of years to mind it mind it both are almost a century now into that suffering both of them began their suffering kashmir in 1947 palestine in my book in 1947 as well although officially in 1948 um but as you can see they both basically began their their misfortune began at that you know just one year apart from each other and they're both still suffering on the same level so india is basically working with israel uh you know on committing the same level of genocide displacement um you know murder mass murder torture rape and everything in kashmir uh, that is being done in palestine so there you have it. Um, and in all this digression, I've actually forgotten even my initial point <laughs> that I was beginning. But anyway, the point is that, yes, my books, which thankfully I remembered, uh, my books uh, are along those categories where I very openly, as well as subtly, obviously, as well as in a hidden way, talk, I mean, sort of highlighted all these issues. These issues remain a background and a foreground in all of these, on all of my books, basically. In the Mist series as well, it's all about, you know, me challenging the American uh, misinformation on 9-11 and on uh, the war of, on terror and on, you know, using and abusing all its allies, including Pakistan, and, and just, just describing the fact that America does not have allies. All the so-called allies of America are not allies. They're just slaves, you know. Um, and, at, you know, at the same time, highlighting the, the Kashmir issue. Um, and a novel is, uh, is a book that I wrote uh, in the 90s. Can you believe it? In the late 90s. And it... I myself could not believe how apt it still was, which is why I published it when I did. It was just so apt for so many reasons. Uh, it was so apt because of the COVID thingy going on. It was apt because of Kashmir still going on. It was apt because of the um, racism, discrimination, chauvinism. I mean, everything that was still go that was actually more now. I mean, I I've always said as a civilization, we are regressing. We're not progressing we are regressing um and this book being apt today you know <laughs> 20 years later i mean this is i don't know if i should be happy or sad if i should be horrified or mad i really don't know so yeah take a look at the book um it's available in hardcover as well as paperback as well as ebook um in ebook form it's available like practically everywhere um smashwords kobo nook uh, it's available even in places that every single place that you can think of where ebooks are available, my book is available. Um, in the form of paperback and hardcover, it's available um, on Barnes and Noble and it's available obviously on Amazon Kindle. So, yeah, um, all my books basically, yeah. Not just the Mist series, but a novel also. They're all, they're all available. Um, in paperback and hardcover. Um, so where the Mist series is all about, you know, as I said, uh, it was actually, you know, my answer to the cliches that the American government and the American press and media seem to be collectively, um, you know, producing 
um, in the thriller spy genre, you know, where there was once upon a time where everything was all about Russia and all the misinformation and all the wrong and, you know, propaganda. Um, you know, when, when, when there are certain American audiences that, you know, actually dare to talk about how Chinese dramas are propaganda, it makes me laugh so much because the amount of Kool-Aid that the Americans have drunk of their government's propaganda um, regarding China, I mean, that in itself is a perfect example, the fact that they have no clue as to how f more free, uh, developed and advanced China is compared to America. Believe me, the Chinese people are enjoying more rights, more freedom, more privileges than the Americans are. I mean, have you forgotten the Black Lives Matter movement? Have you forgotten the um, alleged, you know, terrorism you know, which they claimed they were by the Muslims, but obviously it came out to be their own false flag operation of 9-11. What did they do with the Muslims? What are they still doing? In fact, I keep on and on reminding everybody that 9-11 was basically the spark that they needed, the excuse that they needed, the fire that they ignited in order to be able to do what they're doing in Palestine, what they did, what they're doing in Syria, what they did in Lebanon and still are doing and what they've been doing in the Middle East and what they're doing in Pakistan. You know, it's, it was always, this, this, that was always for this basic reason to, you know, control, to subdue and control the Muslim world so that the Muslim Ummah should not get together and practice the jihad. And that is why they kept on and on talking about the jihad. And that is why they kept on and on scaring the American people and the Europeans, you know, um, so, what the Israelis are doing, um, that crusade is that is crusade and that is acceptable. But the Muslims defending themselves, that jihad is not acceptable. I mean, it doesn't that make you laugh? I mean, have you as you have opened your eyes to your stupidity, um, to how much you've been brainwashed? Doesn't that just make you laugh? I mean, it's it's amazing. It's amazing how stupid people can be, despite the fact that they actually have access to free. Uh, in you know, free full information on the internet, and still they choose to be ignorant, and then they choose to wake up after the damage is done and say, "Oh, we're so sorry about what was done in Iraq." You know, do you honestly think the people are going to accept your apology? I mean, to me, the American public, the European public, the Western world's public are equally responsible for whatever it is that their governments and their establishments have been doing and are doing and will be doing. So the world war, the genocide, whatever comes next, um, all the chaos, the catastrophe, the deaths, everything, the public of the Western world must share their, that responsibility and that accountability equally. So don't, don't think you're just gonna get away with an apology. That I mean, how, how can you keep on doing that every single time? How can you keep on waking up so late? You did that with Bosnia, you did that with Iraq, you, you're doing that with Syria, you're doing that with Pakistan, you're doing that with Lebanon, you're doing that with every godforsaken. I mean, what is wrong with you people? You did that with Vietnam, by the way. You know, what is wrong with you people? I mean, seriously, when will you learn? from your history and from your mistakes. I don't know. And then you talk about, you know, oh, these lives matter and those lives matter. So black lives matter, but Muslim lives don't. Palestinian lives don't, you know. I mean, listen, what I'm trying to say is that obvious, every life, that is the reason why there was a retort, you know, when, when I'm sorry to say this, but when the African-Americans start marching about black lives matter, although, we totally sympathized with and and empathized with them but you know why this retort of every life matter began uh, matters began yeah because you conveniently seemed to have forgotten the palestinians and the kashmiris you know their lives matter too the fact that they're being crushed in their own land by your government that is what matters you know, you can't get away with that. You can't eschew 
from that seriously you can't you can't just you know say oh that's that's different it's not different if it's different then i'm sorry but then you won't have the whole world sympathizing with black lives matter movement either because they're going to say oh it's different you know if you're only going to stick to it's i mean again it's it's that hypocritical moment you know or ideology where you're saying that no we're only going to talk about ourselves um but we we will justify the occupation of an existing state by a state that actually does not exist and we will continue to insist that that state exists because we have decided that it exists even though it actually doesn't exist you know and the state that actually exists we are going to graciously decide on whether we should accept it as a state or not <laughs> palestine already exists the word philistine you know which you people very wrongly call philistine yeah that is from philistine which is palestine okay so just mean just just look at the words even you're using have you ever used israel no it is always philistine okay so philistine palestine always existed it doesn't need you to recognize its existence the the, the actual thing that that actually warranted your need that warranted the need for you to recognize its existence was israel because it didn't exist so a state that does, that doesn't exist that is the state that you choose to recognize or not recognize but a state that already exists a state and a culture and a civilization that's even older than yours who the hell are you to think about whether you need to recognize it or not how dare you you know so you european countries we don't need you to recognize palestine because it already exists what you need to debate on is the existence of israel because israel is not real and that's a fact so moving on um here is another fact that we need to understand now if you remember um bushra bibi um you know the wife of imran khan um because she's been insisting for like almost a month um that she's been fed corrosive substance and she actually uh, even claimed that it was a toilet cleaner harpic that she thinks is being put into her food or she was sure that has been added to her food by the police by the punjab police um and despite the many orders given by the court to you know get her tested um as we know the police refused and delayed um the intelligence the army the government they all worked together to you know ensure that her res- that her tests were not you know taken on time because remember any doctor can tell you any any in fact even if you're not a doctor i mean seriously don't tell me that you have watched a bazillion number of police procedurals legal procedurals detective shows and read like a million detective stories and again police stories and investigative stories and novels and that you do not know that any corrosive substance or or poisonous substance or any toxic substance or any drug related substance any tests that you need to do has to be done ideally within 24 to 48 hours right to exactly know what the situation is and you're telling me that after 4 weeks during which we actually do not even know if they still continued feeding her that corrosive substance you know um off and on or in smaller quantities or if they completely stopped for a while because as we know our body heals our body keeps on and on you know um our immune system just keeps on and on working against any foreign substance that comes um so and and that is also one of the reasons why when you even do a drug test you have to do it within 24 to 48 hours because it can just pass out after that your body can just you know eject it or it can just you know um be 
sort of already your body's immune system starts working against it you know so um now there are two things here that i need to try to understand because if you remember in my previous podcast um i said that i have i that uh, according to the news her daughter came forward and it was mentioned um that she had a perforated uh gastric lining you know and now what i'm understanding from you know the the news as it comes again is that they're saying that um it, that according to the reports um it is actually an inflammation a mild inflammation um now again first of all um as i i think i did actually mention this in my previous episode that you know um who is to know if the results are going to be tampered or not right and this is a this is something that was you know voiced by even the pti members this was voiced by basically everybody i think anybody who's got a brain would immediately suspect um that you know the results can be tampered because we have seen it we've seen the elections being tampered with the by elections once again have been heavily tampered with as we know the mandate has once again been stolen as we know i mean this is all predicted because we know exactly what they're going to do um as you know it's my policy never to trust or invest in anything or anyone here in pakistan for this exact same reason that i can't even trust the government um so here i would say um this is something that even when i had the conversation with my mother um you know when we first uh, when it was first found out that no they're finally they've done the tests and i asked my mother i'm like who's to say that the doctors at al shifa hospital are actually going to tell you the truth you know it doesn't matter that her lawyers there it doesn't matter that her doctors there um that does not guarantee that they will tell the truth you know um obviously they cannot mess the actual test the actual endo, uh, the endoscopy but they can it, the the end result is what counts right um you know if 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 the result the report does not correlate um then how the hell are you going to you know prove what it is that she's saying so the do- the fact that the doctor again gave this roundabout ambiguous report but but somehow managed to put the word inflammation in um you know that that was uh something that i guess you know i think he he did it knowing that at least those in the medical field will immediately understand what exactly is going on because there were reports of her chest uh you know uh, suff- suffocation you can say in the layman's term uh, where she's had difficulty breathing so obviously your esophagus your chest and your gut right um these three get heavily uh, affected whenever you're fed corrosive material or corrosive substance especially on a regular even if if it's a semi regular basis um you know just think cyanide think agatha christie and cyanide okay come on you i'm a writer you're readers um you're also some of you might be writers too um just i mean come on let, let's use our common sense here and and first of all how many of us are pre med i swear pakistan has been a hotbed of wannabe doctors i want to be in the sense that you all the parents always wanted their kids to be doctors so i can safely tell you that of the educated law i mean of the people that have actually received um education to this extent um to the extent of graduation let's say minimum about 980 to 90% have definitely been pre med if not in the intermediate level at least in the metric level they've had, they've been science and in the intermediate level they've mostly been pre med or pre engineering right so seriously how many of us are pre med out there even i'm pre med o levels for crying out loud you know and i'm telling you that that the journalists in the mainstream media gharida farooqi and the likes um when they're trying to make up these stories about how inflammation occurs when you eat um spicy substance and this and that and that that's normal because it's just a mild inflammation um people like me who have two cells to rub together in my brain um obviously we're going to say that she is definitely taking the mickey right she, because 
because what I'm trying to say is that people have actually um, berated her and the other journalists for being so ignorant. It's just like how we berate the American journalists for being so ignorant. But, you know, as soon as I berate the, the journalists on, uh, you know, uh, of the American media and ours, I immediately also say another thing that it's not like they don't know. No, no, no. They're pretending. They're pretending not to know. Or in other words, they're making fools out of us because they think we don't know. Get it? And even if they do know that we know, the fact that they're still lying to our faces just tells you how shameless and how brazen they are. So the same thing I'll say about our, our journalists is they're basically showing you how brazen and how shameless they are, that they're of the same level as our politicians, where they're like, you know, you know that we know that you know that we're lying so who cares you know we're gonna lie anyway what can you do you can't do anything you can't do anything to us so we're just going to keep on lying to your faces you know it's 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 that it's it's where they're you know deliberately messing with the people they're deliberately insulting and offending the people so I, that's what Karida Faruqi and the likes are doing. It's like they're like telling the people that we don't care that you know that we're just spewing rubbish, um, you know, and that we're deliberately misinforming and we're deliberately, you know, creating a false narrative and we're deliberately lying to your faces. In fact, all the better that you know um, that we're doing that because, you know, you can't do anything about it. So, yeah, I mean... For, again, I would say the same thing. Um, our people should not even listen to them. Because, listen, the, the media is all about viewing and rating. It doesn't matter if it's negative. As long as they're getting it, as long as they're getting the views, they're getting the ratings, right? To them, negative publicity is publicity nonetheless. So I've always made it um, a point. In fact, I never needed to make it a point because it's part of my nature. I don't listen to bullshit, that I can't abide by, you understand? So if I don't like what somebody's saying, I just shut off the TV. I don't sit and swear at them and keep on listening to them, but I've noticed that our people do that. And I'm sure even in America and in Europe, because at the end we're all human beings and human beings are essentially the same, no matter where they are. Um, and you know, because I've seen my own mother do it and you know, finally she stopped doing it because I kept on and on telling her, I'm like, why are you even listening to them? Why? And this is the time when, you know, when they started barking their asses off before ousting Imran Khan. And that is why I kept on blaming the public even then uh, for that. I'm like, the public kept on listening to them. They kept on abusing them. They kept on cursing at them. They kept on swearing at them. But they kept on listening to them. That is what gave them, you know, believe it or not, but that is what gave them that push, that power to finally work to oust Imran Khan. It wouldn't have happened if our people had just turned off all the TV, if our people had just told them to shove it, if our people had literally smacked them and told them to shut up, instead of just berating them and abusing them and cursing at them and then watching them. As you know, I, I always said our people are Tamash Bean. Tamash Bean are spectators. You know, those people who always gather around a spectacle, they gather around a performance, they gather around, you know, any uh, anything uh, in the streets even, and they're like, oh, well, let's just wa watch a tamasha, you know, let's watch a spectacle. That's what our people are. And finally, our people have realized um, how toxic this, this habit is and this quality of ours is, how toxic it is that, you know, it has led us to this point. This, this toxic characteristic of Pakistanis and even Indians and Bangladeshis, but especially Pakistanis, have led them to this point. And now they've realized it. And now people are not watching the TV, <laughs> but the damage is done, actually. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, now the mainstream media has suffered hugely and still is suffering hugely because now they're not getting their views, they're not getting their ratings, especially since they were not allowed to mention Imran Khan's name properly. So now there are these few people who try to dare to pretend to be, you know, um, but still within the realm, within the accepted realm of the dictators. So 
yeah, that's not flying, you know. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that these journalists that are deliberately provoking, they're probably rage baiting. I wouldn't be surprised if they're rage baiting. You know, there's this new thing about how people are realizing how social media's influencers are, um, have suddenly learned how to utilize, you know, um, these negative feelings um, and create um, an algorithm for themselves in the sense that, you know, they, they will, they're actually uh, gaining more views, gaining more comments while producing rage bait uh, videos. But, you know, this is nothing new. This is something that the mainstream media was always known for, rage baiting, you know, provocation. As I said, you know, creating the spectacle so that forcing people to watch them and swear at them, curse them, or continue watching them, you see. And finally, the people have learned that this, this is wrong. We should not do that. Because I've always told my, as I said, I used to tell my mother, you're enabling them. You are actually giving the mainstream media the views and the ratings that they want, you know. And to think that now they're doing that on social media, seriously. Um, rage baiting, <laughs> seriously. Seriously, how do people even fall for that? And why, why do people even, I mean, if I don't like something, I just turn it off. I don't waste my time on it, you know, seriously. That's how I used to shut off the, you know, the, the, the news, the media, the TV. I haven't watched TV in years, you know. But anyway, so now in my, at home, in my house, the TV is almost always off. Now everybody's on the social media checking our preferred people out instead of listening to bullshit, seriously. So yeah, that's how most people in Pakistan now are. Most houses, their TVs are now off, except for those idiots that we still have that are still supporting the traitors. But then, you know, as I said, there's something wrong with you if you're still supporting those people, seriously. You're either as corrupt as them or you're sharing in the benefits of their corruption directly or indirectly. Um, or you're just internally just dishonest, but you just never got the, the chance, really. But you're just as corrupt and dishonest as them. That's all I can say. Unless you're flat out stupid. Or you're traitors yourself at heart. Because, I mean, come on, how many of you are actually going to say no the day you get an offer of an American passport. How many of you are going to jump for joy when you find out our currency uh, will remain Pakistani because Americans will never let us benefit from the US currency, but you will have a US passport by some miracle Pakistani passport because Pakistan will now be the, officially the colony of the US, so you will have the US passport. So. How many of you are actually going to happily ditch Pakistani passport? Think about that. Okay, so coming back to that. Um, the reports. So the reports that are being so avidly discussed. Um, there are two questions that come, uh, and they're both basically legal. One is, if the report is actually real, then it's leaked. If it's leaked, that can lead to legal repercussions, although one may obviously, again, uh, you know, claim that what legal, you know, we, we don't, what legal repercussions, we don't have a legal framework in Pakistan, it's been destroyed, there is no law in Pakistan, so, okay, but still, in any other civilized world, this would be, you know, um, cause for suit, you can file suit for leakage of medical reports. Um, number two, if it is fake, once again, it is cause for suit because you have just faked a result. As we know, the hospital was basically um, barged into by a large number of uh, intelligence agents um, in plain clothes, but they were so obvious, you know, to everybody. Everybody knew who they were. And as we all know, the minute they came, they immediately took control of the administration and they took control of the whole, you know, caboodle of the test results. And so at that time, I'd already said that that means get ready for a fake report, obviously. So we've got that. So most, I mean, it's very obvious that the report has been tampered with and the tampered report or the fake report is what is being discussed in the mainstream media. But as I said, 
I don't know now which part of that report is actually true because even in that report, still inflammation is mentioned. Um, and now, this is something that even doctors will tell you, as I said. Um, the fact that there is inflammation at this point, four weeks after, you know, four weeks later, um, that is actually alarming. That is, if anything, that is proof of, you know, suspicious activity. That is proof that, yes, some foreign substance, some corrosive substance has been entering her body. Um, because if you are having problems in the chest, if you're still having inflammation in the esophagus and you're still having inflammation um, in, this, in the, the gut, the gut lining, the stomach, um, then yes, it means that you have been constantly exposed to something you shouldn't have been. Your organs have been exposed to something that was toxic. And the fact that you were having inflammation after four weeks suggests that you're at a healing stage now after four weeks, which means that, yeah, there is trouble in the area. You know, it means that something is wrong. It, this is not normal. Minor inflammation is not normal. I mean, any, let me tell you one thing. Um, actually, if you want to go into great details, um, I just listened to um, the interview that Dr. Muhit Birzada did with uh, um, another doctor uh, who is U.S. certified um, and I would, don't want to get his name wrong. Yeah, Dr. Vakas Nawaz. Um, and, oh, is he Nawaz? Sorry, did I get his name wrong? Anyways, Dr. Vakas, right? And he is, uh, he is basically, he specializes in the field of gastroenterology, okay? And he's US certified, obviously. But he's originally from King Edward. And then from there, you know, after doing his MBBS, then after that, you know, he went to America. From there, he got his, he passed the American board you know, and blah, de blah. But in other words, point is he is certified to speak about it. And he has in great detail explained why he thought that actually even the mention of, you know, Zer uh, Zargar is Zargar 1, which is basically, you know, uh, when you are just one stage behind full re rehabilitation of your organs. You know, when your organs, when they're in the healing mode, Inflammation is basically Zargar 1, which means that you still have to be completely healed yet. And he also thought that this was a matter of concern, just as how I thought that still having inflammation after four weeks of delay, um, you know, of tests. And uh, yes, it is alarming. I think, as I said, anybody with a brain would consider that suspicious. And, and, you know, even if you don't want to listen to him, although I would really suggest that instead of listening to crap, you should please listen to people who actually know what they're talking about. Because as you know, um, in Pakistan, there are, I mean, my pet peeve, as you know, of, about Pakistan, um, and maybe even India and Bangladesh too, I don't know, and I don't really care, but because my mind is to do with Pakistan, is the fact that majority of the people in Pakistan who are in the jobs that they are, have not acquired those jobs or those posts um, through merit, as we know. I mean, this is also Imran Khan's pet peeve, you know, that people should be qualified. They should attain whatever it is that they have attained through merit. This was our pet peeve as well. Those of us who worked so hard to get the qualification, to get the job, and we're finding out that we're not getting the job because somebody else has used his connection or somebody else is being parachuted or somebody is bribing his way through, you know. So especially in government, also in private-minded, don't think that private people, private sectors are very pure. They do that too. Uh, but but especially it's the government sector. This is why I say not, I, that I would never trust the government in any way because in the government sector, 19... 99% of the people um, are not qualified. They're not there because of their merit or qualification. They're there because of connections, because of, their, or because of bribery, because of being parachuted. And that is why, actually, they cannot 
work in dignity. That is why they do not have integrity. That is why they are always compromised. That is why they can be easily compromised. And that is why even, I'm sorry to say, but even the doctors, although um, actually Pakistani doctors, in my experience as well, are the best. They are amongst the best in the world. I'm sorry, but, um, but this is again those doctors that have gone abroad. Pakistani doctors who are the best of the best, they always go abroad because they truly are the best of the best. And they're in high demand all over the world. Um, as opposed to Indian doctors, actually the, the cream of Indian doctors remain in India. Um, and in my experience, at least abroad, I have met some of the worst doctors in the form of Indian doctors. And over there, in, in fact, when you're abroad, you literally look for Pakistani doctors, to be honest. Um, and you consider yourself very lucky if you get assigned a Pakistani doctor. Um, so Indian doctors were dreaded um, abroad, but Indian doctors in India, I think, are the cream. Um, so it's opposite in Pakistan. In Pakistan, the cream is not in Pakistan. The cream is all out because, as I said, they're in high demand. But nonetheless, we have very good doctors within Pakistan as well, but we have a higher percentage of not very good, not reliable, I'm sorry to say, very untrustworthy doctors that you wouldn't trust as far as you can throw, which isn't saying much. So, yeah, you're very lucky if you find a good doctor in Pakistan that you can truly trust, to be honest. Um, and I'm, I'm sure many people will agree with me. So, yeah, to find, I mean, I'm not surprised that the doctor is compromised. In fact, that was, as I said, that was the first question I asked my mother when, you know, she mentioned that, oh, finally, she's getting the test. I'm like, you know, can we really trust? Even I mean, so what if it's, Al in fact, who cares that it's Al-Shifa Hospital? It's still in Pakistan. It's still in Lahore. It's still a Pakistani doctor. He can be compromised. The whole hospital can be compromised. So I wasn't surprised when the news came that, you know, um, a heavy deputation of police and um, a, he a large number of, in, you know, intelligence agents um, were there at the hospital and they had immediately interfered with the admin. You know, I wasn't surprised. So, yeah, I mean, that is why I'm not even surprised that the report doesn't correlate and the report is compromised to a large extent. But the fact that the doctor managed to still you know, stick the word mild arrhythmia in um, saying, you know, basically, in other words, that there's inflammation. I think that that was probably his way of trying to, you know, just put it through. And so, as I said, please listen to the interview so that you get the actual reason why doctors abroad um, are having a problem with this report and why they have a problem with the journalists who are twisting things and the journalists who are making people, you know, um, fools so but but again if you're too lazy to, to even listen to something that's worth it then let me just give you this 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 simple definition okay this is something that everybody should know the scientific definition of inflammation is inflammation occurs when the body releases chemicals that trigger an immune response to fight off infection or heal damaged tissue once the injury or infection is healed, the inflammatory process ends. Understand? Once the injury or infection is healed, the inflammatory process ends. And this is why I'm saying you should listen to him when he talks about the Zargar 1, that his concern is that why is it still at 1 and not at 0? It's this, the inflammatory process hasn't ended. Why? Four weeks and the inflammatory process hasn't ended. You know, and nevertheless, again, you need to understand when you are constantly subjected to toxins in your body, especially corrosive substances, um, then the healing, even when it does occur, um, it's on the upper level. Imagine, imagine that you have hurt yourself forget the internal organs think about your skin on the outside okay you've got a wound on your arm for example okay it's clotted right it's scabbed now it's healed but you can see it's light scarring on the skin right now 
the scarring seems to disappear after some time. But you see, that is superficial. The scarring on the top layer of your skin has been mended, it has disappeared. But the second layer of the skin still is scarred. It will not mend because the scar is so deep that the top la layer of the skin has somewhat managed to clean up, smooth it up, you know, you can't see the scar. But the depth of the scar in the second layer of the skin remains. So that's basically what happens in your internal organs when, you know, when, when you constantly get exposed to toxic corrosive substance, substances is that the, the underlining scarring remains but the top layer, just the top layer, heals. So you've not actually healed. You've just covered that area with another lining or a layering. You understand? It's just like it's covered that area. The, but the internal scarring remains. And that can later on become dangerous. It can mutate. You know, it can mutate. It can change itself into something more dangerous. You know, and that is why they say that there is possibility of future cancer, you know, when you continue to do that. So that is why the doctors abroad um, are pretty, pretty worried about this whole thing, you know. Uh, so please expand your horizon. Again, I would say listen to the right people to gain the right kind of knowledge, um, you know, and don't just listen to BS because, you know, it's fun, you know, it's, it's, it's not fun to be misinformed, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so, you know, as I said that, you know, uh, the fact that our people have been sold out and treacherous one way or the other throughout and they're only realizing, uh, you know, the intensity of it, the repercussions um, is, is why Pakistan has landed where it is today. And even now, if people are not going to stand up for what is right, you're, you're basically just, you know, um, doing America's job for it, of destroying this country. You know, in fact, America has already done, it has already taken a step further in its, you know, in its plans towards friendly occupation, which is something I've been talking about for a long time. It has declared Pakistan war-torn. Now tell me, what part of Pakistan is war-torn? And why is it war-torn? Pakistan is not war-torn, but it is definitely politically torn. But what America is trying to do is, is trying to tell the world that Pakistan is now unstable. And who made Pakistan unstable? America. Who allowed America to make Pakistan unstable? We did. We did by not properly stopping these people. We protest, yeah, but again, I told you a thousand times, protesting like this will not work. With the kind of people that we're dealing with, protests will not work. Anything legal will not work. Desperate times call for desperate measures. We should have declared a revolution. We should have declared a mob revolution and overnight just taken them all apart and killed them on the spot. This would have served as a reminder to everyone in both in and out of Pakistan never to mess with us but we didn't do that you know you know since 9-11 America has been on the verge of trying to declare Pakistan bankrupt trying to declare Pakistan war-torn trying to declare Pakistan unstable trying to declare Pakistan ready to be occupied so many times and they have never been successful until now. Why? Because of Maryam Nawaz, because of the army, because of Zardari. They are successful today. Why? Because we allowed these people to come back. We allowed these people to stay alive. That's why. So, yeah. This is why, as I said, is essential to understand why our every act, our every careless, reckless act can lead to
to a catastrophe. The catastrophe that we are in today is simply because our people were reckless, they were selfish, they were inconsiderate, they were narcissistic, they were self-centered, they did not care. They did not care um, as long as their lives were fine. Even now, there is still a batch of the people who are thinking, oh, as long as we, we're okay, as long as we're okay. And you're not okay because, as you can see, have you ever heard of Pakistanis in the you know of, of poor people in Pakistan living below poverty line to such an extent where they can sleep starving Pakistanis have never slept starving and I'm sorry but let me just say this but the people in the village the so-called poor people they actually eat better than those of us in the cities or at least that's how it used to be but now thanks to Maryam Nawaz thanks to Asim Munir thanks to Zardari thanks to the establishment now the people of the village even cannot get real food they cannot get food so who's to blame for that we are we are to blame for that because we did not get rid of these people you know when i kept on and on talking about how we need to get rid of these people while imran khan was still prime minister and these people kept coming and barking in the mainstream media there was a large portion of our population that kept on and on and on you know telling the, the government to get rid of them but the government refused to because imran khan thought he was living in a civilized country where he wouldn't go against the law and yet right now where is that law that same law is being used and abused both against him and against us, the people of Pakistan. Sometimes you have to take drastic measures for the good of the future, for the good of, you have to, when you think long term, then yes, sometimes you have to do the deed. You know, you just have to do it. You can think about maintaining the law once you've actually structured the legal framework of the country, which has long been compromised. I mean, why would you even think that we actually had a legal framework? It was long ago compromised by the same traitors because they keep coming over and over again. And why do they keep coming over and over again? It is to ensure every time they came to take it one step further towards the destruction of the institutions, towards the destruction of the organizations, towards the destruction of the state. As I told you before, this is a long-term plan. It took them 70 years to get this done. And they finally did it. They're there. They are there today. So, yeah, let's see now. I mean, I, again, I would say, the amount of protests, the amount of, you know, it will not help. I'm sorry. You just need to just go out and kill them. There is no other way. We need to send a message. We need to send a clear message to anyone and everyone treacherous, both in and out of Pakistan. And that message can only be sent by killing all the traitors. Well, this is me signing out. Khuda Hafiz.